Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about criminal justice reform. I work a lot on the high school topic in preparation for the SDI. And then I judge some high school debates here and there. And I certainly um, kind of check in with a lot of the SDI students, but CJR in particular has seemed to like take a life of its own. I don't really want to speak for anyone, but the negative seems to be just like rough sailing. Uh, and I'm kind of, you know, curious about what you all are sort of thinking about as you prepare for the end of the season. You don't need to give away anything um, that is like proprietary, that's like in your wheelhouse, you know, Austin saving this strategy for the TOC or something like that. But your negative, the opponent says new AF. What are some things that you wish that maybe you had done differently? What are some things that you think have gone well? And, you know, what do you kind of view as just some reliable negative turf, if any, that exists in that spot? I know that when we're negative against um, new apps, we have like the general philosophy of if it has an impact that we can turn, then like that's pretty much the A strat. Um, and then after that, it kind of gets hazy process counter plans, like ESR, um, courts, anarchy is one that we've uh, thrown around a little bit. And then even the K1, so that didn't go too well. Um, so I think at this point of the year, politics with a process counter plan or just an agent counter plan seems like the strongest press against any new app just because i mean the you know burden for an app to be good on this topic is a congress key warrant and politics at this point like a pretty good diss-ed um so i think it's like a pretty solid strategy but without that i don't really know from you know two thousand miles away it seems like west high school has been rocking tea against some of, I wouldn't say necessarily new apps, but maybe some more obscure apps. And so I wonder if they want to comment at all um, and give a different answer than Austin. But again, I don't want to have anyone give away anything that uh, sort of reveals trade secrets. Um, I definitely agree with everything Austin has to say. It's good to have a lot of options for the 2NR open when you're debating a new app. So throwing a politics this ad and process counterplan in there alongside like maybe a K is a good idea. But I also think that topicality is really underrated on this topic because everyone knows CJR is so big and a lot of teams just use that to get away with some pretty abusive apps. And um, I just feel like there's a lot of viable T interpretations and some teams aren't fantastic at handling their offense. So I feel like it's a good idea to once again, just try and keep your options open. I always love extending T in the 2NC because um, it puts a lot of pressure on the 1AR. And if you have some good definitions and a few different like violations that apply to most acts on this topic, it's definitely strategic in terms of like both a prepped case neg and just something to have in your arsenal against a new act. Um, and building onto that, like my experience debating with Madeline too is like, being a 2A, I've realized that like the topic is so big. So like obviously like 2As and just like a bunch of teams go crazy with AFs. Like there's so many AFs, right? But it's also like nobody is prepared to defend T. Like so many few, like there are very few teams that are actually like ready to answer it. Like even I like didn't, like I kind of blew it off every 2AC and like recently just like cause Madeline goes for it like a lot and reads it a lot. It's like, I've realized that like teams should probably be more prepared for that, I guess, in the last like few tournaments of the season. Cause it's like, it's a pretty viable option. And I think that people are like, just kind of now realizing that or like now learning, like, I guess, which interps are best or whatever. But I definitely think that it's like one of the most underutilized, but like strategic arguments that you can go for. I mean, I guess, especially against new apps too, when there's so many different apps and they can be like super small on this topic as well, so. Yeah, I think the like recognition that like T is a real argument is gonna lead to a bunch of what my prediction is are court enacted rule laughs. I think everyone is gonna be reading a court enacted rule laugh. Um, I don't know anyone who isn't gonna cut one for the TOC. Uh, I just think like 
I mean, they do have a pretty good answer to TNX. The, the cards are pretty good for the app. Could you elaborate like a little bit more for the audience about um, kind of a little bit more what you mean by that? So the right evidence that everyone likes to read on T is like enact refers to processes of the court. So like, for example, the app that we read about like federal, the federal evidence app that we read, uh, Westminster read a very similar app to ours, but read it as a court and active rule app. And I'm pretty sure like Niles West does that as well and a few others. So it's the apps that like change the procedure of the court uh, which technically would mean that the court enacts something. It's not, a, they're not enacting legislation, but they're enacting a reform to their processes, which is what the right evidence is about. And is the reason that most courts have stolen the thing card. Okay, I can't tell if the reaction from the rest of the students is one of reluctant agreement or one of utter frustration that might depend if you're a 2a or a 2n who knows westminster i might uh just jump in here westminster broke a court and acted rules off in quarters of the berkeley tournament against us and their answers to topicality um were sufficient i would say um and one thing that makes court and acted rules f so we have been doing toc prep based on what has a deficit to courts what has a deficit to states and what beats TN Act. Um, I think for the TOC, um, based on some evidence that some other two ends and some other research that some other um, debaters have been finding, it's gonna be harder to find deficits to the court's counter plan than previously. So teams, I think one reason why teams are gonna to move to court and act rules apps is because the court's counter plan doesn't compete. Um, community consensus seems to be that the court's counter plan competes via Congress apps. Um, like so permutation do the counter plan is not a legitimate 2AR. Um, and teams think that like the courts can do anything in the world and that it doesn't link to the politics DA, which probably isn't true, but debate world is not real world. Um, so I also think court enacted rules are gonna get more popular. But one thing that I think is gonna matter more for the TOC is the state's counter plan. I don't think many people have been going for the state's counter plan because there's the federal prison system, but the states are actually a much more powerful actor on the criminal justice topic than most people think about. So for example, there's, a, there's some teams that read apps about the federal prison system and their deficit to the state's counter plan is like, can't change the federal prison system. There are some court enacted rules apps that make this argument. But if the state prison system is larger than the federal prison system is something I've been thinking about recently, maybe it just solves the same impact on a different scale. So like thinking how to frame counter plan solvency for the TOC is what we have been doing. And I think court and acted rules have a good um, angle against counter plans because they don't compete. But conversely, other counter plans that have fallen out of favor might become more popular. And having those generics like Austin was talking about is gonna be important in new after debates. So like we didn't have a good state's counter plan against Westminster and it. I don't think states would have solved that off, but having good generic counter plans is going to matter. I do want to follow up in a moment uh, with a thought I had about Gabe's quarterfinal debate or Minnesota, Minneapolis South's quarterfinal debate at Cal, uh, but I, it seems like Austin wants to jump in, so I'll let Austin jump in first. I think something similar. Um, the Lopez counter plan seems like a, a funny counter plan uh, against new apps. Uh, well, I mean, look, the classic response to Lopez, the best is theory, and um, like, Whenever the app is new, uh, the 2 and R gets to be screw you, we're not against the new app, so like you can't go for theory. And I'm not really sure what the app says against that. Um, and so in that case, it's like you have to have an actual solvency deficit or an, an impact turn uh, to the Lopez counter plan, which seems like is a recipe for next success. I don't really agree. I don't think, so like I'm a 2A, like I don't think the net gets condo. I don't think the net gets fiat. That's a, that was a joke. That was a bad joke. But um, I don't know. I, I think the Lopez counterplan is like the world peace counterplan. It just yachts whatever you want. And like, yeah, new half. But like, I don't know. I feel like I feel like the old trusty abolition is going to be what everybody's going to go for at the POC. 
I think everyone's going to go for abolition of the security gang. So let me let me go, Carly. Do you want to go, Carly? I was just going to say to to all of your points. I think each season has phases to it, and T and generics have a big role in sort of the season opening tournaments, and those things kind of come back around towards the end of the season because of new apps and because of how teams conceptually prepare for end of season tournaments. And so, you know, there's sort of seasons within the season and we're kind of coming up on the T generic abolition phase of the season. And I think you all are totally right about kind of the way that NIG teams are gonna approach the end of season prep in that respect. So great chat, a lot going on here. I'm gonna to react to a few different threads. So first, Zach, the negative definitely gets fiat in front of like 99% of the judges. Um, and most judges are, are, are probably gonna vote nag against conditionality bad if it's a new app. So a little bit of what Austin led with there. I, I wanna, I, so Gabe, I, you know, I, I think I sent a congratulatory note to um, Gabe and to the West students, right? after the octafinal result and Gabe responded and said, you know, it's a new app. So I'm kind of sitting here and I almost responded to Gabe and I decided to kind of stay removed, but I almost responded and said, when it's a new app, new apps put a lot of thought into how they're going to handle the off case and secretly don't put a lot of thought into how they're going to handle the case. So maybe this means like, Austin comes with a terminal impact term, but a lot of times the case just stinks. And it's maybe a rel because you can't generate a disadvantage in those debates, but it's just amazing to me how far someone can get with a cross X thread or case D in one of those debates because of the next thing that I wanna transition into, which is the way that one, in my opinion, should prepare for breaking a new AF. I do think that there's a risk and the CJR topic going into the last few tournaments of the year to have quantity of new AF outweigh quality of new AF. So when Carly was a senior at Michigan State and Carly was preparing for the NDT, we didn't write like eight new AFs, even though in theory we could have been affirmative many, many times at the NDT. Uh, we wrote a very small number of affirmative arguments and rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed things that people don't think about, like practicing the cross-examination of the 1A. Um, I'll have Carly answer this question in a moment, but in the final round of the NDT, when Carly debated Northwestern, we had practiced her 2AC against X number of hypothetical 1NCs. And in a moment, I'll have Carly reveal how many practice one NCs she gave. But if each time you practice, someone's giving you a different rotation of off case arguments or a different rotation of case attacks, you wind up being in your comfort zone when these kind of unknown contingencies emerge. And so as all the students uh, that are listening to this call, much just the ones on this call, think about the preparation for the end of the season, of course, it's exciting to steal six new apps or to you know, craft a few more of your own. But you really are running into Hannah's comment that like you might forget to write a good blocked T or you might run into, you know, Austin doing surprisingly well on attacking or terminally impact turning your case. And I just think that if you narrowed the number of new apps that you wrote and you felt really good about each one, you'd be surprised how often you could even run one of them back a second time. I know that there's this idea that it's exciting to say new, but if you break a new AF in round five and then you run that same new AF in round seven, how prepared is your opponent really gonna be in that situation, especially if you have like all your blocks to everything and you've rehearsed it. So to each their own, but I do kind of wanna say um, just a little bit of work on second line stuff has a surprising amount of ROI. Now I'll turn it over to Carly and she can um, comment in any manner that she would like, but can also reveal the answer to the trivia question. We didn't track it, I, but the Northwestern tournament ends usually the first week in February. And I did like two or three, two ECs a day between that and the end of March. So it got up there. Um, but I think to your point, and, and this goes back to what everyone was saying about how the neg is going to prepare. Like if you have eight new apps, but you can't beat process counterplans because you haven't practiced what your perm strategy is going to be, 
then you might as well have zero new apps because you haven't really thought about where the end of the debate is going to be. And so I think if I was apt and preparing for the end of season tournaments, you know, you want to have new arguments, certainly. But if you really do think you can put a lot of the neg teams on process counter plans, I would be spending a lot of time having mini debates on counterplan competition, counterplan theory arguments, going back to the basics on thinking about the way that counterplans compete, you know, having practices with the 1A where you talk about the way that you're gonna cross X against those types of counterplans in order to create firm ground for yourself, giving two ARs and scripting a bunch of that in advance more than maybe I would wanna have a sheer quantity of new apps because I, I do think that there's gonna be a lot of process counterplans. There already are, it seems like from when I judge high school debates, and if you can go for, you know, the intrinsic perm and feel really good about it, or you can go for, you know, perm to counterplan and have a bunch of definitions that you have for it set up or anything like that. I think it has a lot more end of round vision than just thinking, you know, how many apps can I, or how many rounds can I say new app in? You'll have a better win percentage if you think about how many two ARs can you win. We've said a lot. I'd like the students to react to kind of anything that we said. I want to offer a couple more tips uh, before we close. But any thoughts on sort of the breadth of the topic, uh, the fundamental diagnosis that negative is a little bit tricky uh, on this resolution, uh, or any sort of the reactions to what we've been talking about, which is the prospect of, of new apps going forward? Um, speaking from personal experience, I definitely agree with what Carly has to say. Um, me and Hannah broke a new app in, I think it was our bubble round at Green Hill that we just did not have a good understanding of. We hadn't even done a practice round with it. And it ended up being probably one of our most like scattershot crazy rounds of the season. And I mean, we did end up winning, but when it comes down to it, we only read that app in just that round because it really wasn't great and we didn't understand it too well. But then our next new app we broke, we spent a couple of months uh, cutting better cards. We did a few practice rounds with it and we just tried to like understand it a lot better. And then we ended up reading that app for like two or three tournaments. So I definitely just agree that it's much better to spend a long time doing some practice rounds and getting a good 2AC stuff put together before breaking a new app. I definitely agree with that. So I have a similar experience in that um, I ended up cutting a, a very complicated court staff um, and then never gave a T to AR before I broke it um, against Westminster. And so we lost the T and it was like probably one of my worst two ARs of the year, just because I, this is an argument that I hadn't answered all year. I've been reading a Congress app, hadn't really dealt with, uh, you know, T enact um, and hadn't done enough thinking about it. And so breaking it, I was not near as ready as I should have been. But now like our main strategy all year has been like, you know, read the same base ask, same mechanism, but like break a billion new advantages to it because libertarians say we should do lots of things with the government. And so just, you know, kind of innovate um, horizontally instead of vertically. And sorry, sorry, vertically instead of horizontally. So like more development of one app instead of uh, less development of like 10 apps. So that kind of bleeds into some ideas that I have for practice. A lot of the students that will be listening to this call, uh, you know, they might come from a two horse town. It's just them and their debate partner. The idea of having a full on practice round is not a very easy thing to accomplish. Uh, maybe they, they do or they don't have coaches that could, could stay after school for hours on end and, and sort of do all the rehearsals that we've been discussing. And so I just wanted to kind of offer a tip to, to that segment of the community. And it, it is my advice as you begin to prepare affirmative or negative for the tail end of the season. And that is to kind of try to maximize your, your ROI, your return on investment. Let's say you have two hours. Well, you, you could have a full on practice debate. And, and in some ways that would be wonderful, but that full on practice debate honestly prepares you for one situation that one negative might run and you may never see elements of that situation again. Instead, as Carly sort of indicated at Michigan State, and this sort of stems from some of the curriculum we have at the SDI, you can kind of invest that same two hours in 
practicing a negative block speech vertically three times and making sure your answers to mansion and cinema will vote switch are good enough or practicing horizontally your extension of the politics to add your extension of the critique your extension of you know ddev or whatever else and every time you do those things kind of trying to get a second bite at the apple doing them again making your um speeches a little bit more familiar a little bit more comfortable maybe even a little bit more timed that same notion exists kind of with a multiplier effect on the affirmative. I don't know, Carly can correct me. I don't think Carly in preparation for her senior year NDT had a single full practice round, but I would estimate that she had 50 practice two ACs where at the end of each practice two AC, the question that was always posed to Carly and that eventually I think Carly posed to herself was what's my two AR gonna be against this? What's my two AR gonna be against this process counterpoint? What's my two AR? gonna be against enact topicality. And if you're making up and writing your 2AC front lines on the fly, people think that the downside of that is that you're wasting prep time. That's part of the problem. But the big problem is that you haven't really mapped out what your 2AR is going to be. And so for all of these major positions, for whether you're affirmative or negative, sort of rehearsing the middle of the debate with an eye on what your final rebuttal will be is sort of you know very very significant when you hear gabe talk about his strategies against sort of different genres of apps he's sort of saying to himself i don't know that the answers to states will be strong enough i don't know that those apps can withstand the court's counter plan you do kind of want to have blueprints where you've sort of put a little bit of forethought into what the end of the debate will look like or else you might be surprised at what emerges at the end of the debate. Um, I'll let Carly and anyone else kind of react to that. And then I think we'll wrap up. Yeah, I, the thing I've been thinking about too, as we've been talking through all of this is sort of the psychology of end of season tournaments. I mean, for a lot of people, you know, their high school careers may be ending, maybe they're not gonna debate in college. It feels high pressured. And, you know, thinking back through my experience, like, if you don't practice a lot of times, then all of that nervousness creeps in and you're kind of not just going through things that you've practiced a million times. Like I can remember, you know, debating in the final round and feeling like my muscle memory just took over on giving the 2AC and I was so nervous. And I think that's normal. I think everybody is really nervous at the end. And it really just needed to be something that I had done a million times and felt really comfortable with. And if it was an app that I didn't know as much about or hadn't thought through as much, I think it would have been a lot harder. And so, you know, both on the app and the nag, I think rehearsing some of those middle parts of the debate so that you do have the muscle memory for high pressure debates is really important because it's normal to be nervous. Everybody's going to be nervous in these spots. They're big. They feel important. You know, you're doing it with a partner and you want to do it for them too. And so having kind of rehearsed it, I think, uh, has dividends from a psychology perspective as well. Yeah, I think it's why most NBA coaches would say if their team was down by one with five seconds left in the game, they'd rather have a B-plus set play that they felt good about than a potentially A-plus or F-minus extemporaneous play. Because we've all seen the end of that basketball game when the free-flowing on-the-fly decision just goes wildly awry and there is something to debating in your comfort zone, affirmative or negative, just because you've kind of prepared what you want to say. And it just sort of, I think from an ethos perspective, the confidence and familiarity flows through. So the last thing I wanna say and say it to the audience, and then I'll, I'll give the students an opportunity to say anything else they'd like to say is that one of the weirdest things about the end of the season tournament is that your high school season has gone through, as Carly said, these stages where you've been judged by people who are dipped in the high school community on a regular basis. They have strong and familiar opinions on topicality and counterplan competition and which apps are savvy and which apps aren't. And one of the strange things that emerges 
at the tail end of the high school season is that you get judged by a series of people that weren't around for that roller coaster ride. And you're not really sure where their norms fall on some of those exact questions. As someone that has been in the college community and has regularly come and judged uh, the NDCA or the TOC in tournaments at the tail end of the season, the topicality norms that people have strong opinions about are norms that I wasn't around for that journey. And so it doesn't mean that I won't vote negative on topicality or some such thing. It just means, you know, that's not as self-evident to me. And so as you price in all of these things that seem obvious to you, make sure that they're reflected in your preps or else you might get uh, someone that just, you know, absolutely doesn't share the the sort of group think that's emerged and not that the group think is right or wrong or that your judge is foolish it's just sort of something to consider uh, as you prepare for the tail end of the season you might um, catch a curveball in that process so i'll pause there um, and give kind of the floor to anyone that would like to throw in anything else and 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 we'll and we'll weave it in to the tail end of the convo One thing that I have found important for like the psychology of um, end of season or of debates and important debates is like sticking to your guns and um, going for arguments that you are comfortable with. Like Carly was talking about muscle memory. Um, sometimes like you can write a new argument. So for example, we wrote a new argument that we thought headshot um, this app that a team was reading that we'd been beat on before. And then we debated them at a round robin and we lost on a 2-0. Then we went for an argument at the tournament proper that was much similar to arguments we've been going for in the past. And we were much more successful and we won that debate. So like sometimes like people write a lot of new arguments for the um, NSDAs, for like your state championship, for whatever is your end of season tournament. But let's say you write a new argument and you have one practice debate on it. Or you've been going for like a somewhat worse argument and you've had 20 rounds on it this year, and the opposing team has only had four rounds on it this year, you still have a massive prep advantage. Like, so sometimes sticking to your guns, you actually have a larger prep advantage, even though it's not new. And that's something that has made my like speeches, like, when I've had to debate new affirmatives or things in those situations, even arguments that don't have a shock factor can be much more strategic. Yeah, I don't know how much we're going for war stories here, but I was thinking about when I watched the 2007 NDT finals and Emery was neg and they, the neg block was basically the amendments counter plan and stare decisis on the court's overrule topic. And I mean, in the abstract, that had kind of been the negs thing all year. It was sort of a snooze fest. Stare decisis is not like the flashiest of things that you could go for. And I can remember when they were giving the neg block and watching it as sort of like a young student watching it, like you're watching like a football game, being like, ugh, like amendments and stare decisis, this is boring. But then looking back on it, it was hugely successful because it was exactly that. It was just in their wheelhouse. It was something they had practiced. They were totally ready to go for it. And it was ultimately really successful. And so I think that's that's one thing to kind of think about too. You're not doing it for the the like the awe factor of what you go for, you're doing it for the W. 